Welcome back nerds. In today's video we're going to be learning how to extend our ground. That way it looks closer to the original game. We'll also be adding fully functional blocks, both the face block as well as the question mark block. And we'll finally be tackling the mechanic for both grabbing and throwing enemies. And we're going to start out with dragging our floor all the way down to the ground. And what we need to do is create a new tile set that matches our dark and light browns from our original grass tile set. I'm going to go in there and copy the portion that I want. And then create a new tiled sprite. We'll set that to 16 by 16. And then I'll paste in what I copied off my old one. And I'm just going to flip that. And then I'll grab the fill color of the brown and just fill it in everywhere. And this will give me a new tile set. And we can drag that out underneath all of our original flooring. And potentially you bump into an issue where you have some blurry sprites when you drag them onto your map. And that's because it's automatically smoothing out your image. And you can go into your resources here. Click on the new image you just added and uncheck that box smooth. And then if you click off and come back, you can see it is no longer blurry. And then we're just going to need to go back into our scene and double click on that object. And just resave it. And that should just refresh the cache, allowing it to find the new non-blurry image. Alrighty, our floor is looking divine. Next up, we're going to be looking into adding some interactable objects. So pay close attention. We have our blocks, our question marks, and for some reason, Luigi. No. Mm -mm. Blocks and question marks. First up, we have our blocks. And these are little squares that have eyeball looking things on them. They act as solids until you jump into them from the bottom and this flips them around and makes them no longer solid. And you can also destroy them if you're both big and use your spin jump. But that is not something we have to worry about yet since we don't have big or spin jump yet. So for now we will program a solid object that turns off solid when you jump into it. And we'll see if we can make an animation that makes it look like it's flipping around. And we're going to go ahead and treat this like a platform object. And then if we hit it from the bottom while it's spinning, we'll disable the platform object until it finishes its spin animation and then we will reset it. So that'll allow us to fall and jump through while it's spinning. All right, now that we have some floating objects that we have to deal with, there's a few settings we should go back and make sure are working how we want them to. So first off, we're gonna open up our Mario object and we're gonna click on Edit Collision Masks. And as you can see in the image, our Mario does not take up the whole collision area. So we're going to need to set a custom collision mask for Mario. And we want to remove all that blank space because this counts as a solid. If you jump into one of the solid bricks, you're going to end up hitting it while you're still about a full Mario away from it, which will lead to the premature death of a lot of Marios. So let's go ahead and click on use a custom collision mask. And from here you can either edit the X and Y numbers or you can drag and drop until you have it where you need. And up top there's two different toggle switches. And these will allow us to share the same collision masks for all our animations. And assuming they're all around the same height, this will be great. Or you can use this to get a good base and then go back and edit the outliers. So once we're done with our mask, we'll want to go back and make sure Mario can actually jump a good height. And I'm going to want him to be able to jump on this new face block I put down, which is four grid squares above him. So I went in and edited his platformer object behavior. And we changed the gravity to 720, jump speed to 408, and jump sustain time to 0.4. And since I changed Mario's gravity, I'm also going to go in and change every other object that interacts with gravity. So right now we have the Goomba, Koopa, Beach Koopa, and Shell Attack. All right, now that we are jumping at the right height again, and we have our face blocks in our map. We need to find a way to interact with them correctly. So we can already jump on them because they're solid. So now we need to be able to hit the bottom of them and make them spin. And I'm gonna use an additional hitbox check for this. And what that means is I'm going to create hitboxes or small objects on top of the face blocks. And if the player collides with the face block as well as this smaller hitbox, then it means we hit the targeted area and we'll be able to set the box to spin. So we're going to open up our face block and we're going to click on edit points and we want to create a new point and I'm going to call it bottom check. 
and it'll be at the position x1 and y15. And now I'm going to add a new object. And I'm just going to call this one face block hitbox. And for our animation or our image, I'm actually going to set the size to 14 by 3. And then I'm just going to fill the color in with any color because these are going to be set to invisible. But we also want them to have a color so when we're testing we can see them. And then in our event sheet, I'm going to create a condition that happens at the beginning of the scene. And it's going to repeat once for each face block. So we're going to pull this new screen up by right clicking on a at the beginning of the scene, cursoring over add other, and clicking on for each object. And this does not create a sub event. So now we're going to click and hold and drag this over so it's underneath our at beginning of scene. And then on the top part, we're going to fill in what object we want this to repeat for. And we want this to happen for every face block. There's no condition. Our condition is earlier at the beginning of the scene. We want this to happen once for everyone, no matter what. And then we're going to create that face block hitbox at the position of face block dot X. Then inside there in quotes, we're going to call that bottom check we created. And we'll go ahead and grab that again for the Y position, which means we're going to create that face block hitbox slightly inside and very near the bottom of our face block. So it hangs just over the bottom, but not quite to the edges, meaning if you hit the edges or you hit the top, you're not going to trigger this. But if you're hitting the bottom, you're going to hit this extra check and we'll create a second condition for Mario is in collision with face block and Mario is in collision with face block hitbox. And this is where we will build our spin for our face block. And for testing purposes and a placeholder, we'll just throw a face block delete action in here. That way we can verify that we are actually triggering both those conditions. And if this is not working for you, there's one of two options. Either your face block hitbox is not coming down far enough over the bottom of the face block, or you potentially have a gap between your jump and fall animations on Mario, which is causing you to miss hitting both collisions at once. So now we need to go ahead and create our animation. Only now, instead of deleting the face block, we're going to set it to play the flip animation. And we want this to have a set amount of time, not go forever. That way, once it finishes, we can set it back to the idle position. And then whenever face block is in idle position, we will set the platformer object to true. And then whenever it's playing the flip animation, we will set the platformer to false. So in the end, I have frames 1 through 12 playing the new images I created, which gives it one full flip. And then I put the original idle into frame 13. And then I replay my image one more time from 14 to 23. And this will make it flip two full times during the flip duration and gives me 23 frames total. And I set that to 0.1 seconds per frame. So it'll be 2.3 seconds of flip time. And this allows me to let it play through. And then on completion, I can set it back to idle. Inside of our code, we're going to remove the delete face block. And we're going to add an extra condition to verify that face block is currently idle. And this will make it so it does not count as a collision while the face block is currently flipping. And if those conditions are met, we're going to set the animation of our face block to flip and also turn off the platform behavior. And in a new condition, if our face block is currently on flip and finishes its animation, we're going to set it back to idle and set our platform back to yes. And additionally, we go ahead and set the face block checks to visible no. All right, with our face blocks working, it is time to add a new object, and this will be for our question mark block. And we'll go ahead and put a animation in for idle. As well as for rotating. And we're going to make sure we set this one to loop. And also slow it down a bit. I chose 0.15. When you click on the question block, under the properties, you can go ahead and change the animation from 0 to 1, which changes the starting animation from idle to rotate. It is looking spiffy, but currently it is an object that you cannot interact with, though our face blocks are working quite well. Last up for the question block, we need to add the dead face for after we boop it. And then from there, we will treat it almost the exact same as we treat the face block. So we'll create a bottom check at 1. 15 and we'll also add an event where we summon a face block hitbox on the question blocks as well 
And then in our events, if Mario is on collision with question block, and Mario is on collision with face block hitbox, and the animation of question block is idle, we're going to go ahead and delete that face block hitbox because we won't be using it anymore. And we'll also set the question block to used. So here's what we're working towards. We have our blocks, and when we jump into them, we get this little bit of wiggle. I don't think this part's actually meant to be in the game, so we're not going to try to mimic this where it pushes out the bottom of the other one. But we definitely need to add something because ours is looking flat. So we're going to give it that extra bounce on contact. So let's go ahead and hop into our question mark. And we're going to edit with Piscal. And we're going to go ahead and resize the height to 32. And then just drag our question mark block down to the bottom. And we're going to redo this for all the animations. So rotate as well as used. And we'll save those up. And that's going to move all of our blocks down on the grid one. So we're just going to reset that. And then we'll hop back into the question mark block. And we're going to create a new animation called knock up. And then I'm going to go into idle. And I'm just going to copy that image so I can paste it into knock up. And then using the hand tool, I'm going to move it up slightly. And now that I have this set, I'm going to duplicate this frame. That way we have five different ones. And the first three are going to slightly go upwards. And then the last two are going to drop back down. So it's going to give it that little bump effect. And once all those are in place, go ahead and save it. And you can go ahead and set the animation speed to 0.07. Hop into our code events. And now instead of just straight up setting the animation to used, we're going to add a new one to set animation to knock up. And then we need a new event. And in the new events condition, we're going to check if our animation is currently on knockup and also check if it's finished. That way when question block is done with the knockup animation, we can set it to used. So we'll simply drag the action we already had for set to used down to our new condition. And at this point, we're going to bump into some issues. When we set bump checks, we were doing it based off of a 16 by 16. And now we have a 16 by 32. And again, we want to cover the bottom portion and have it go past. So we're going to have to reset the bottom checks to 131. And we want to do this for both the idle as well as the rotate animation. And now when we bump it, we can see that little knock up. At the beginning of our scene, we're setting a face block hitbox based on each instance of a face block. And we're going to want to create a for each instance of question block. And we're going to set it off of that. And now we have one more issue. And that's our collision check. So we're going to go in and edit the collision mask and we're going to create our own custom one. And we're just going to set that X and Y down to 16. And that's going to be for all of our question mark blocks. You may have noticed our new object, our power up. And this is nothing but a single image with a Boolean variable called rise. And that's going to start out set to true. And now let's hop into our code. And we're going to make edits to the bottom two events. Starting with the Mario on collision with question block. In here, after we set the animation of question block to knock up, we're going to want to create our new object power up. And we're going to create that at question block X and question block Y plus 8. And then we're going to want to set the Z order. We're going to set that to question block Z order minus 1, so it's right behind it. Our animation knock up stays the same. And right below that, we're going to add two new events. The first one's condition is going to check if the power up has its rise variable set to true, which it's going to start out that way. And also if it's overlapping our question block. And the whole time this is happening, we're going to slowly push that mushroom upwards by 18 pixels at a time. And then the first condition of the second event, we're going to see if it's no longer colliding with question block. And if it's no longer colliding and power up is true, we're going to set that to false. That way it will never push upwards again once it completes the initial pop up. And of course, this leaves you with all the tools needed in order to start working on the Mario Grow power up. But due to time, we are going to save that for the next video. And we'll see if we can tackle multiple power ups in that episode. And we have finally arrived. Our video will be wrapping up with the grabbing and throwing mechanic. And now let's take a look at that code we'll need to write in order to make this happen. As you can see, it's a bit longer than most of our other mechanics. But don't let that intimidate you. It's all pretty straightforward once we break it down. 
First, we're going to add some variables to our objects. Mario will need a boolean called is holding, and that'll be set to false. And as for the enemies, we'll be giving the mechanic to our Goomba for now. And we're going to need to make sure they have three different booleans. Is flipped should already be there. And we'll be adding is held and thrown, both as booleans set to false. Additionally, Goombas are going to need a new behavior called tween. And this behavior allows for you to set a first state and a last state, and then an amount of time to go from the first to the second. And we'll be using this for our throw power. And finally, we need a scene variable called throw speed, which will be a number. And the default value does not matter for this since we'll set it in our code. Next, we'll need objects to check our collision. So we're going to create two new 16 by 16 objects. And in game, these will be set to hidden, but you can set different colors for each of them for testing purposes. One object will be used while holding, while the other will be used while throwing. Inside of our object points, we're going to need to set a position where our object will be held. And for all of the images in my animation, I'm going to use point 1525, except for one, and that's going to be frame one of the run animation. And I'm going to set this to 1524 instead. And this will give it a slight bob up and down while Mario is running, and it'll make it feel a little more realistic. Diving into the code, the first code we're going to write will deal with if we should be picking up enemies or not. So our condition is going to check if Mario is in collision, and then verify that the enemy is flipped. Additionally, it'll make sure Mario isn't already holding something. And then we don't want this always happening, so we're going to require that the player is holding down the Z key. And if all this is true, this will set is held and is holding both to true. So we can continue to track those for later and also create a held projectile at the enemy's X and Y position. Adding this line of code is going to make it so that the grabbed enemies will always follow along with Mario at our new hold point position we just created. Now if a player hits the X key while the is held boolean is true, we're going to go ahead and delete that held projectile because we're no longer going to be holding them. Then we're going to set the new state of the enemy and Mario. They will no longer be held, they will no longer be holding, but they will be thrown. These next lines of code work with the scene variable we just created, and we're going to start off setting that value to 500. And we're going to call a new action we've never used before, and you can find this by searching tween a number in a scene variable. And then we're going to have to set the first value to 0 over 500, which is milliseconds, with linear easing. And we're just going to name this to throw speed so we can find it later. This code allows us to aim our throws. Any enemy currently in the throne state will have a projectile created for it, and we will want that to be hidden. If we are holding up at the time, the projectile is going to go straight up with a force equal to our scene value, throw speed, which will be going from 500 down to 0. And if we aren't holding up, we want the projectile to go left or right depending on which direction we're facing. And we check this by looking at where the enemy we're holding is compared to our Mario character. And the force added works the same way, with just a different angle for the direction. Currently, there is still a bug here. The enemy can be affected by the directions we're pressing shortly after throwing as well. But we're going to leave this for now, and we'll worry about it later. This code here is checking to see if throw speed finishes a tween. And if it does, our throw is done, and we need to change the state of our enemy to false and delete the projectile. This will stop the enemy from killing other enemies on collision. Speaking of killing other enemies on collision, the entire time an enemy is in a state of throne, they will need to be deadly, so we will reset the position of the projectile to that enemy constantly. Finally, we need to check if the enemy hits other enemies. We will be needing one for thrown enemies, and they will be checking for projectile collisions with an enemy without projectile active. When that happens, we destroy everything overlap with their projectile, and the projectile objects as well. Much like the enemy thrown resetting projectile position, the enemy is held needs to reset the held projectile position. And now we can recreate the projectile thrown event, but for held projectile is held. And that's it. Once you have all the code in place, you'll be able to grab and throw enemies in Super Mario World. And that's all the time and then some for this video that we have today. I look forward to seeing you all in the next one. And until then, peace.